Toxic by Mark Franklin Chapter 2 May 2014 Missouri, the United States of America Everybody agreed that Chad Forrester looked good for his 68 years of age. Hell of a good. If you'd asked anyone meeting him for the first time to hazard a guess at his age, most would have pitched him somewhere in his early 50s. His craggy looks and lean frame would have made him box office in 1950s Hollywood. Every day other than Sundays, Chad favoured the cowboy look, which was somewhat ironic as he'd never farmed a cow in his life. This day-to-day -day gear owed nothing to fashion. Instead, it owed everything to his relentless practicality. Cowboy attire had evolved through 200 years of American history. It was the right gear for anyone farming the millions of acres of the American interior. A Stetson hat kept the sun and rain off. A check shirt and jeans were robust enough not to get all frayed and torn by day-to-day -day manual work. The boots were comfortable, hard-wearing and long-lasting. Why should he not choose such tried and trusted attire simply because different citizens leading different lives in America's coastal cities had turned honest workwear into a caricature? Chad had been wearing jeans for work for the last 28 years. The fast lane shed operation on that rainy July night in 1981 turned out to be the last time he served his country in the field. A few weeks after returning home, he broke his ankle pretty badly during a training exercise and the army doctors told him that his Delta days were over. He left the Special Forces and returned home to the Screaming Eagles and their home base in Fort Campbell, Kentucky. The 101st were not remotely ready to lose him and they fast-tracked him into their training team, which they were pretty sure he would go on to command one day. For five years he enjoyed the process of breaking down and then reconstructing new recruits, and he was more than happy at the prospect of eventually being given command of the whole training program. But it wasn't to be. In the autumn of 1986 he received word that his pa had died of a massive heart attack. Chad did what he always did. He did the right thing. He was an only child and his ma was all alone up on the 100,000 acre corn farm and she needed him to come home and take it on. So he went home. And he became a corn farmer for the next 28 years. But Chad Forrester wasn't just any Missouri corn farmer. He was a corn farmer who would have gone on to get a PhD in pure math at St. Louis University if he hadn't chosen to head out east to the Aishau Valley and Hamburger Hill. His pa had taught him all he needed to know about how to bring in a crop. Now he added a different dimension to the family business. He applied his mathematical brain to the workings of the futures market which danced its frantic dance a few hundred miles east in the Chicago Board of Trade. At first he was timid. He dipped his toes carefully into the swirling waters of the corn futures market. Then he assessed and he drew himself graphs and he analysed all the prevailing factors. And then he started selling his crop two, three or even four times over. And nine times out of ten his trades made a return. He sunk all of his trading profit into acquiring more land. The 1990s were a tough time for corn men. Prices collapsed and they stayed collapsed. This mattered little to Chad who could trade a profit out of crashing prices just like he could trade a profit out of rising prices. By 1992 he'd grown the family spread to just shy of 10,000 acres, which we decided was quite enough. His ma had passed away in 1990 and for a while he'd rattled around the old place all on his own. Then he'd received word that an old buddy from the Screaming Eagles had been killed in Desert Storm and he drive down, drove down to Arkansas to attend the funeral and to pass on his condolences to the widow. To his utter amazement he fell head over heels for the widow and two years later they were man and wife. They were still man and wife 22 years later, and Chad was the proud father of two sons, both of whom were dead set on becoming corn farmers just like their dad, and not airborne soldiers just like their dad. This was perfectly fine as far as Chad was concerned. He had watched the torments of the US Army in Iraq and Afghanistan, and both wars looked a little too much like the torment he had endured in Vietnam for him to have any wish for his boys to follow in his footsteps. By 2014, the dark days of the 90s were long forgotten and corn farming was suddenly as good as it had ever been. They have three markets now. 
There were the two traditional markets, human food and animal food, but now there was a third market, which was growing with every passing week. Ethanol. More and more American car miles were powered by corn. Three markets instead of two meant more competition, more demand, higher prices, more volatility in the Chicago Board of Trade. More opportunities for the smart trader to make the big bucks. And Chad Forrester had indeed made big bucks, huge bucks. He had become a very wealthy man. In fact, as he took his daily quad bike tour of his crops as a big fat sun eased up over the eastern horizon, it hit Chad that he was one hell of a lucky guy. His life was a great life, as good as a life could get, a real five-starred American dream of a life. It was his custom to park up his quad bike on top of a low, gentle hill that was the highest point on the family spread. It was a fine place to take in the dawn, to take a moment or two, to reflect on things. He killed the motor and pulled a pack of Marlboro lights from his top pocket. Smoking was a Vietnam legacy that he'd never managed to get rid of. He hadn't tried particularly hard. He liked smoking. His dawn Marlboro moment was his turn to allow his mind to wander back down the years. And every morning it arrived at the same familiar patch of ground, just as surely as the sun would climb up over the Missouri horizon. Dong Ap Beer. Dong Ap Beer in the Aishau Valley. A hill marked on the maps as being 937 metres high. A hill named by the US Army as Hill 937. A hill named Hamburger Hill by the men of the Screaming Eagles who gave their blood to reach the top. By the time Chad's platoon had gotten there, the last few yards to the summit had looked pretty well like a scene from the lower reaches of hell. The trees were all shredded by high explosive. The churned earth was littered with body parts. American body parts, Vietnamese body parts. Body parts from eight of the guys in his platoon who never lived to take in the view from the top. Body parts from eight of his guys who never lived to read the handwritten sign that Sun Wag had nailed up on the trunk of one of the few trees that had survived day after day of murderous American ordinance. Hamburger Hill. Every morning he used this private time with the big rising sun to allow his eyes the luxury of tears. America had asked them to descend into the pit during those desperate days on that desperate hill. America had asked fine, decent men to behave like the worst of animals, and they had not flinched. They had entered a world of darkness, and they had won their victory. In the end, they'd used their bayonets to make those last few hard yards, and two days later, the army evacuated Hill 937, and the army had never returned. And six years later, the army had done exactly the same from the roof of the embassy in Saigon. He'd never talked to a living soul about what he and his men had done in those last few yards, and he never would. But every morning he'd light up a cigarette in the glowing light of the dawn, and take time out to remember, and to wonder if any of it could possibly have been right. If doing duty could ever excuse that kind of inhumanity. Most mornings he'd limit his memories to a mere ten minutes or so, but not this morning. This morning his mind moved quickly along from Hill 937 to a completely different memory. This morning his thoughts were filled with the memories of a dark Scottish night of teeming rain. Memories of a night when thousands of men all around him were sleeping off their celebrations of an English cricket victory. A night when he had ghosted through a naval base like a Viet Cong insurgent and buried a five kiloton suitcase bomb behind a disused shed half hidden by hawthorn branches. Over the years, this duty had come to trouble him almost as much as the last yards on Hill 937. What kind of man had he been back then? He had a picture of himself in MacIver's Pentagon office, ramrod straight and staring at the wall behind the Admiral's head. He hadn't moved a muscle. He'd barely blinked. He'd absorbed exactly what he was being asked to do, and he had absorbed the fact that this was a mission he was expected to volunteer for. It wasn't a mission he was ever going to be ordered to undertake. And he had accepted it in a heartbeat. No hesitation, no nagging doubt. His country required him to do a job that would keep the people of America safe in their beds, safe in their privileged lives, 
safe to farm their corn and watch their primetime TV or go to the ballpark or send their kids to school on yellow buses. This was a mission that made more sense than Hill 937. If the Red Army had ever got the chance to match the achievements of American science, then the people of the United States would have been in danger. That was what men like Chad Forrester were for. They were required to do whatever it took. They were not required to think. They were not required to open their minds to moral panic. They're expected to get it done. And he had got it done. Perfect job. And for a while he'd been pretty damn proud of the job he'd done, especially when the Soviet Empire collapsed like a condemned tower block. But as the years had rolled along, he had become less certain. In 2002 he'd booked himself a trip to Glasgow. He'd hired a car and driven it out of the city in a long gear lock, past the gates of Fastlane, past the garish colours of the peace camp. He toured the area. Gerlock Head, Helensborough, Dumbarton, Dunoon, small struggling towns surrounded by picture postcard scenery. Gerlock Head, population 1265. Helensborough, population 14,626. Dumbarton, population 19,990. Greenock, population 45,647. Dunoon, population 8,251 and villages and hamlets and houses out on their own. He sat in supermarket cafes, he sat in pubs. He watched kids playing ball and pram pushing mothers passing the time of day. He watched farmers tilling their fields and bins being emptied and postmen delivering the mail. Tens of thousands of run-of-the-mill lives old men and young boys, mothers and shop girls, workers and unemployed, tens of thousands of unfinished lives, stories yet to be written, dramas yet to be played out, tens of thousands of regular people who were completely unaware that their lives could be cut short in a blinding flash of light and a howling gale of superheated air because Chad Forrester had once upon a time buried a five kiloton suitcase bomb behind a rickety old shed. He had done what he had done without thinking. He had done what he had done because he was a patriot. His country would always come first. Nothing else mattered. Nothing else made sense. But these familiar certainties had faded with age. Slowly but surely he got to asking more questions of himself. Why on earth had he ever been so convinced that an American life was always worth so much more than the life of someone with a different nationality? It was ridiculous. Racist, in fact. Wrong, for sure. Loving America was no excuse for hating everyone else. For laying down a contingency plan to murder tens of thousands of completely innocent people in cold blood in order to retain a military edge. Over the course of a thousand breaking dawns, he'd come to loathe what he'd done. He was shamed by it, soiled by it, polluted by it. And then the evening before, he had channel-hopped his way to a CNN documentary. His wife was out for the night on church business and his two boys were at football training. He hadn't been in the mood for paperwork or catching up on what had happened on the futures market. This was starting to happen more and more. He was 68 years old, for Christ's sake. Maybe it was time to ease back a little, to allow himself some leisure time, time to listen to the wide words of Louise for once. So once he'd eaten his dinner and cleared away the dishes, he'd pulled a cold beer out of the fridge and settled down in front of the TV. And he had channel hopped until he stopped at a CNN, and a special documentary about the referendum that was about to go down in Scotland, on September the 18th, 2014. A referendum to decide if the small country he had visited twice was about to split away from the rest of the United Kingdom and make a go of things on its own. And more to the point, what would be the big consequences of such a thing happening? And halfway through the 14th minute of the special documentary, his attention was grabbed by the sound of a one that very particular word, fast lane the Royal Navy base that was home to the United Kingdom's nuclear arsenal. 
The presenter explained how the alliance of parties who were campaigning for a yes vote in the referendum were all in total agreement about what stance an independent Scotland would have in regard to nuclear weapons. They wanted none of them. They saw nuclear weapons as an unacceptable obscenity, inhumane, evil, not welcome. An independent Scotland would instruct the UK government in London to remove all nuclear weapons from Scottish territory and to put them somewhere else. Anywhere else. Anywhere but Fastlane. The blood had drained slowly from Chad Forrester's weather-worn face and he did something he'd never done before. He lit up a Marlborough in the house. There was a very simple reason why he had made the big bucks by playing the Chicago's futures market. His scientific brain had always been quick off the mark when it came to absorbing a number of different factors and then predicting what outcome those factors would create. For 28 years he had used this skill to great effect as a trader of corn futures. Now his brain automatically started to weigh a completely different set of facts. The key to hiding the suitcase bomb had always been very simple. In an area that was home to so much radiation, there was never a concern that anyone would notice a little bit extra. But the situation suddenly seemed likely to change. Once all of the nuclear ordnance was removed from the base, the radioactive signature of his suitcase bomb would suddenly become very visible indeed. The prospective new government was promising to keep Fastlane on and to make it home to the country's new navy. Fair enough, but there'd be changes. Lots and lots of changes, like bulldozing worthless old sheds from 1943, like running Geiger counters over every square inch to make sure the site was safe and clean. Jesus! A Geiger counter would go off like a klaxon if anyone took one within 50 yards of the shed. Then what? Then it would be guys in spacesuits and the mother of all scandals. What the hell is it? It's a five kiloton nuclear warhead circa 1980, also known as a suitcase bomb, or a backpack nuke, or a mini nuke, or a pocket nuke, and then it would take any expert worth their salt about 10 seconds to identify exactly where the bomb had come from. The United States of America. The land of the free and the home of the brave. Uncle Sam. Holy Christ. He booked himself onto a red-eye to Glasgow International for the following day, then lit up a third Marlborough and tried to work out what the hell he was going to say to Louise. When she arrived back home, it didn't take her very long to cotton on. The smell of three in-house Marlboroughs offered the first clue. The second clue was in his eyes. She knew that look well enough. She'd seen that look in the eyes of her first husband when he'd returned from a tour of Vietnam in 1973 and now she same the, saw the same lost lays in the eyes of her second husband. Honey, something's come up. I need to go away for a few days. She went into the kitchen and busied herself with the task of getting the coffee percolator on the go. Where? Scotland. And she kept her back turned to keep her frightened expression under wraps. It's only for a few days, honey. Nothing to worry about. Okay. It's, it's just... And she returned and embraced him. It's okay. I know how it is. You can't talk about it, right? He nodded, said nothing, kept it in. Toxic by Mark Franklin Chapter 3, May 2014 The Clyde Basin, Scotland just under 36 hours later, Chad Forrester's plane dropped out of a thick bank of cloud and made a smooth landing. Most of the passengers who shuffled their way to the immigration desk looked strung out and frayed by the long night flight. The tall man in the cowboy hat was the exception. He was straight-backed and looked as fresh as a daisy. The soldier's knack of catching sleep at any place, any time, was one he had never lost. What is your reason for your visit to Scotland, sir? Tourism. A smile. A returned passport. Of course it was tourism. For why else would such a polite old guy in a cowboy hat have for coming for Scotland? Chad returned the smile and pocketed his passport. 
Forty-five minutes later, he was in a higher car and getting used to driving on the Brit side of the road. He got himself onto the M8 and headed west towards the Erskine Bridge. The clouds were breaking apart fast and the sun was starting to wake the world to sparkle. There were some roadworks on the bridge and traffic was slow, which gave Chad the chance to take on board the view. It sure as hell was a long way from the pancake-flat cornfields of Missouri. In one direction it was mountains and locks, in the other direction it was cranes and old shipyards and the distant tower blocks of Glasgow. He considered the no-smoking sign on the dashboard and then shrugged and wound down the window. What the hell? What were they going to do to him? He switched on the radio and half listened. Everyone seemed to be excited at a bunch of election results from the night before. It seemed like some outfit called UKIP had taken everyone by surprise and come out on top of the pile. For some reason, when the top guy was interviewed, the anchor seemed to be surprised that he wasn't drinking a pint of beer. Jesus! Things were pretty different this side of the pond. It was barely past eight in the morning, and everyone expected this Farage character would be hitting the bottle. The road into Dumbarton was smaller now. More bends, slow-moving traffic. Very vaguely familiar from his two previous visits. He remembered that the town had been a faded sort of a place back in 1981. Thirty-three years had done the place few favours. It was like many similar towns back home. The four-square stone houses spoke of better times gone by, well-built and proud, but half of the shops they housed were boarded up and closed down. Others had given up on the idea of being butchers and bakers and greengrocers. Instead, they were pound stores and bookmakers and kebab shops and pawnbrokers. There were plenty of towns like this back home, in Missouri and Michigan and Ohio and Pennsylvania and West Virginia. Bizarrely, a memory hopped into his head. The guys from his platoon lolling around in a 101st firebase up in the central highlands, a big sagging tent all bleached by the tropical sun, gear everywhere, beer cans and Hershey bar wrappers, and tinny music pouring out of a transistor. Jim Morrison, The Doors, The West is the Best, Get Here and We'll Do the Rest. The West is the Best? Not any more. Not even close. The West had been the best when they had taken such care to build these fine stone houses, and the houses had stood the test of time. But the West had not. The West had seen its moment come and go. Quality time spent with the rising Missouri sun had taught him that this was the real backstory to Hill 937. It had been all about trying to keep things the way they were, trying to stem the tide of history. Dumbarton hadn't managed to stem the tide of history, not even close. At a red light he watched a woman shuffle her way across the road. How old was she? She was stick-thin, and a tattoo curled out from under the collar of her tatty coat and up the chalk-white skin of her neck. She walked like she was carrying an injury a shuffle, a trudge. Halfway across the road she turned to him, and heroin-hollowed eyes met his. Just for a second, a connection made and broken. Maybe she was thirty, maybe forty. Was it a botched injection in the groin with a dirty needle, or a beating for an unpaid bill? The light moved to green and he eased away, soon leaving her far behind. A junction, a great grey box of a building with garish posters in its windows. Be a foster carer. Text FOSTER to 83010. Had the limping woman with the sunken eyes given up her kids to people who had texted the word FOSTER to 83010? Was that why her eyes wore the same hundred thousand yard stare that the young guys in his platoon had worn on the top of Hill 937? Oh, Jesus, Chad, snap out of it, man. He clocked the familiar M sign and followed it like a true blue American. Coffee, black, four sugars, and another Marlboro Light. The news told him that a bunch of masked men had taken over government buildings in Donetsk, and America wasn't happy about it. Would they be checking their gear down at Fort Campbell? 
Would the guys in the 101st be readying themselves? The West is the best. No, Jim, not anymore, it ain't. Not even close. He gave up on the radio, and the road took him past some grey tower blocks and women with prams. Kids headed for class. A bunch of guys in high-vis jackets fixed up the road. And then the sadness of the town was behind him, and the question of whether the West was the best any more didn't seem to matter. Suddenly the world all around him was a Disneyland of jaw-dropping beauty. Boats bobbed up and down on a gentle swell. Oyster catchers poked about on the shoreline. Ahead there were mountains climbing steeply from the shore of the lock. The fields were way smaller than Missouri fields. Cattle, tractors, horses, a golf club. Helensborough. More fine old houses and an esplanade looking out across the water to Greenock. Lots of dog walkers and some struggling tourist shops. The West is the best. Not any more, it ain't. Another set of lights. Another young woman in faded clothes. Another court glance. Another pair of familiar eyes. He recognised the nothingness of freshly used opiates. The echo of a knocked door to an empty house. A million miles of nothing. He had seen good guys succumb to that particular comfortable nothing. They'd scavenged for morphine ampules and had taken a trip to the world of soft nothing. A better world. A world far, far away from those last few yards on Hill 937. He'd never been there himself, though at times he'd been sorely tempted. This young woman had never been to the Aishar Valley. This young woman hadn't even been born yet when the men of the 101st had been choppered up the Aishar Valley. Now the road was even smaller. Not an arrow-straight Missouri road, a winding Scottish road following the line of the Loch Shore. For some reason the sheer undiluted beauty of everything around him brought a feeling of tears into his eyes. Jesus, Chad, I mean, for Christ's sakes. He was getting old. Old and soft and consumed with doubt. And then the road suddenly widened and straightened, just like he knew it would widen and straighten. And suddenly there was a 15-foot high fence running alongside the road. And on top of the fence were evil-looking curls of razor wire. And through the fence he could see two more ranked rolls of razor wire. To his right, a cluster of gaudily painted old caravans had made a home in a small wood at the foot of a steep hillside. Fast Lane Peace Camp. Visitors welcome. They hadn't been there back in 1981, but they had been in place when he'd come back in 2002. A googled video had told him that the peace camp had been outside the camp gates for 32 years. They had arrived at a year after he had left. A police car passed by on the other side of the road. Through the fence he saw lots of new buildings, accommodation blocks, sports pitches, warehouses and the huge box of a hangar where the submarines were serviced. After a mile or so he crested a hill and saw a roundabout ahead. The main gate looked much the same as it had back in 1981. Back then he'd been in a minibus with seven guys he'd never met before. They had sat apart from him silent and anxious. He had not been given any clues as to what they had been told. Whatever it had been had made them nervous around him. He hadn't been concerned. He hadn't been in the market for making new friends. All that had mattered was the mission, the duty. He had been a tool of America, no more, no less. It had been raining on that first visit. The windows of the minibus had been almost opaque. The journey had offered no clues whatsoever of the towering beauty that surrounded the base. Low clouds and wall-to-wall grey. The guys on the gate were swallowed under glistening rain capes. Water dripped off the peaks of their caps. They hadn't taken long to wave the two-vehicle convoy through. It was too wet. And these were Americans, after all. Allies. Fellow warriors of the Cold War. Now there was a queue of three vehicles waiting to be checked through. Stiff policemen stood like statues and cradled automatic weapons to their chests. High above, a couple of buzzards glided the thermals. 
Within minutes he was passing the first buildings of Gare Lockhead. There were nice white houses and a pub. He remembered spending a couple of hours there, reading a book and ignoring the glances from the locals. Nobody had spoken to him apart from a couple of hellos and thank yous. It had been a place where nobody was surprised to hear an American accent. Back then the Polaris missiles had still been the property of Uncle Sam. They were out on loan to the subs in the base, shared with strings attached. It would still be a few years before Reagan trusted Thatcher enough to give her the secrets of Trident for keeps. The village was a horseshoe around the shoreline at the head of the lock, staring down the water to the distant Clyde. He took the small road that wandered its way down the side of the lock opposite the base. After a mile, he drew up in a lay-by and climbed stiffly from the car. A fresh breeze brushed his face, and a couple of sandpipers scratched about on the pebbled beach. He scanned across the water, and brought back imprinted memories of the layout of Fastlane. He traced the route he had taken from the accommodation blocks to the wooded area where the old shed had found a home. Thankfully his memory was clear and it was relatively easy to follow the route he had taken. Only getting a view into the wood was a problem. There were a couple of new buildings which he was pretty sure were blocking his view of the place where the shed had been. The spluttering sound of a motor interrupted his observations. A dinghy came into sight from behind a small outcrop. It was larger than the usual dinghy, with the word POLICE very prominent in black letters on a yellow background. Two passengers, both in uniform. One sat at the back of the boat with a hand on the tiller, the other stood in the centre with a machine gun hanging from his shoulder. They eased back the throttle and glided by about fifty yards from where Chad stood, checking, assessing deciding whether he warranted them coming over to the beach and taking some details. But he was just an old guy on his own, taking in the view. He was no kind of problem, no threat, just another tourist. They pumped up the outboard motor and carried on down the lock. Once they were a few hundred yards away, Chad opened up the boot and dug out a pair of binoculars from his bag. He picked them up the day before from a hunting shop. Three hundred dollars worth of the best optical technology the good citizens of Yena could provide. The wood was suddenly just a matter of yards away. He studied every inch with an old soldier's care, and confirmed the fact that the new buildings blocked the view of the place where the shed had been. He needed to get higher. He needed to get above the roof line of the buildings. Two miles down the road he saw a sign to the right. Coolport. Coolport. Coolport was the laurel to Fastlane's Hardy, Fred and Ginger, Bogart and Bacall. There had been no Coolport back in 1981. It had come later, in the 90s. At a cost of just shy of two billion pounds, it represented the greatest ever British capital project after the Channel Tunnel. He'd spent an hour of Google time the day before reading up on the place. It was a real-life version of the kind of place James Bond bad guys like to hang out in. The Brits had hacked out six huge caverns in the bowels of the small mountain that separated Gare Lock from Loch Long. The nuclear halls of the Mountain King, surrounded by mile after mile of razor fencing and tripwires. These mountain lairs were not home to trolls or dwarfs. Instead, they housed a hundred or so Trident missiles that gave Britain a season ticket for the ball game of Armageddon. The subs were housed and serviced at Fastlane, and then when it was showtime, they sailed around the block to Coolport to load up their ordnance before heading underwater for six weeks at a time. Hiding. Waiting. On hold. Year after year after year of endless monotony and routine, always waiting on the word to come through the wires. OK, chaps, time to earn your money. We've decided we'd rather like you to remove half a million citizens in Novosibirsk from existence, from history, from everything. Time to play God, chaps. What was it but Robert Oppenheimer had said when he'd watched the sky fill with the mushroom cloud from the bomb he had created? I am death, the destroyer of worlds. Two billion pounds of taxpayers' cash had provided a subterranean home for a hundred of Oppenheimer's doomsday calling guards. Jesus, Chad, get a grip. 
He angrily lit up a cigarette and drove up the steeply winding road. There were a couple of places where an elevated view of the base could be had, but the road was too narrow to make a turn. No problem, he had all the time in the world he could come back. After a couple of miles, the road broke out across the ridge line and gave a view over the waters of Loch Long, far below. Christ, this was some kind of fine country. After a further three miles, he reached a T-junction back down at sea level, and he hung a right following a sign to Coolport. And then, once again, the road miraculously widened out. Military signs, lots of warnings. This is our world now, our rules. You don't stop, you don't get out, you don't do nothing, OK? You just drive on by. A roundabout and another set of gates, more razor wire. This must have been the daddy of all contracts for the guys who supplied all the wire. More policemen watched him make his way around the roundabout with bored eyes. And then he was headed back up the hill on a road that would have done any city proud. It was wide enough for four vehicles and lovingly maintained. Every few hundred yards there was yet another sign warning the motorists that this was MOD property and they had best not forget it. There was a huge green truck coming the other way and two police Land Rovers riding shotgun. No prizes for guessing what kind of cargo was on board. After a couple of miles he was back on top of the mountain and another view that was of the to-die-for variety. More to the point, a small lay-by offered an uninterrupted bird's-eye view into the base a thousand feet or so below. There was a curb separating the lay-by from the surface of the road, and about twenty signs had warned him of the dire consequences that might await anyone who had the audacity to stop. Oh, what the hell! He was a screaming eagle when all was said and done. He quietly murmured the old 101st motto to himself as he eased the car over the curbstones and onto the gravel. Rendezvous with destiny. Like Hill 937 in 1969. Like a rickety old shed in 1981. Like a lay-by that wasn't really a lay-by in 2014. How long would he have? Impossible to say. Assume no time at all. He collected his binoculars and climbed out of the car. It only took him a few seconds to find the new building, and a couple more seconds more to track back into the wood to where the shed had been. Ah, oh, shit. Instead of a dilapidated old shed half hidden by a hawthorn bush, there was a porter cabin with a small car parked out in front. Shit. He cranked up the magnification a couple of notches and could see that the porter cabin was sitting on concrete bricks, one for each corner. No foundations. Just a temporary solution to whatever the problem had been. A job done on a tight budget. Clear away the shed and bushes and sit the thing on a few bricks. No digging required. No excited shouts when the blade of an excavator revealed a shiny metal case. No worldwide outcry when people worked out what was in that shiny metal case. And who had made it. And who had put it there. The world always turned on the little things. A decision to save a few bucks by sitting a porter cabin on four concrete slabs rather than digging out an area for a concrete footing. Excuse me, sir. Damn. Hadn't heard them coming. Must be getting deaf as well as old Jesus. Victor Charlie would have had his ass twenty times over. He'd have been slow, slow back in the day. He allowed his binoculars to hang from their leather strap and turned with a big open smile. One Land Rover, two cops, two automatic weapons, safety on, but no smiles. Hi there, guys. It was time to play the bumbling American tourist card for all it was worth. What are you doing, sir? He widened his smile as far as it would go. Taking in this view, wow. Ain't this ever something? I'm from Missouri, and I tell you, we ain't got nothing like this in Missouri. You see, my great-granddaddy came from, you can't stop here, sir. I can't? How come? This is military defense property. Surely you saw the signs. Signs? No, sir, I don't think I saw no signs. Too busy with the view, I guess. Well, what did the signs say? The cop relaxed, sighed, almost smiled. Almost, but not quite. Chad's eyes flicked down to the man's weapon. 
He just couldn't help it. Old habits died hard. Jesus. If any of his men had dared to show up and parade with a weapon as badly cleaned as that, they'd have been on a charge. This is an urban clearway, sir. No stopping allowed. Now Chad's smile was all real. You're kidding, right? Urban? This has got to be the least urban place I've ever seen in my whole life. The guys didn't like that. Please get back in your vehicle, sir. Can I just take a couple of photographs? No, sir. That will not be possible. Please return to your vehicle, sir. Now, please, sir. He returned to his vehicle and reversed back carefully over the curb and drove down the hill towards Gare Lockhead. In his mirror, he saw the Land Rover waited until he was almost out of sight before driving up the road in the opposite direction. Another boxy giant of a truck rumbled by with yet another Land Rover in tow. But this time he barely noticed. Instead, he brought back the zoomed-in view of the porter cabin and assessed what he had seen. There was one crucial detail that had been instantly apparent. The concrete blocks were under a foot high. There was no crawl space under the cabin. Sure, a rabbit or a rat could get under there and do some digging, but not a man. Not a 2014 version of Chad Forrester in 1981. This time there would be no option of sneaking in an undercover guy to steal out into the night to dig up the five kiloton nuke. That scenario was well and truly off the table. After a few minutes he came to a roundabout where the military road turned back into a civilian road. He hung a left for no great reason and drove aimlessly for half an hour before parking up in a genuine lay-by. He killed the engine and wound down the window and stared into yet another view of mountains and sparkling water. So what options could be written up in the playbook? Well, that wasn't for him to decide, thank Christ. Not his duty any more. He was a 68-year-old corn farmer from Missouri. It would be for younger men to call the shots, to come up with the right game. And his duty? Well, that was clear enough. His duty was to find someone to tell, to warn. Because something told him that the memories of what he'd done for his country on that wet night 33 years earlier would have disappeared from history. Those toxic records would have been quietly shredded and burned. Doug McIver was dead and gone. No doubt all the other guys who'd been in the loop would also have died as well. Chad knew he had to assume that he was the only man on the planet who knew what was buried under that porter cabin. His duty was to put an end to that state of affairs. And then it would be for others to decide what to do about it. Like Louise said, he was 68 years old. He'd done his duty, he had served. He'd done everything they had ever told him to do. And every morning tears came to his eyes when the memories crowded in on him. Only one thing left to do then. He needed to decide who to tell. Well, he had plenty of time to think that one through. He had another day in Scotland and then a whole bunch of hours in the air over the Atlantic. So, what now? Nothing much. Just drive. Take in the sights. Get a bite to eat somewhere and find a room for the night near the airport. So he drove and thought, and barely noticed the view around him. Once again, all he could think of was how the place would look if his suitcase nuke ever went off. No more trees, no more oyster catchers, not even any razor wire or policemen with poorly cleaned weapons. Nothing but a smouldering, smoking desert, which would be fenced off for ever and a day. A dead zone an exclusion zone, an irradiated wilderness. The sight of the colourful clutch of peace camp ca caravan snapped him clear of his dark forebodings. He hadn't even noticed that he'd arrived back at the base. He'd been on autopilot. He made a decision which later on that night he found hard to explain to himself. Without really thinking about it, he switched on his indicators and took his foot off the gas. At the southern end of the peace camp was an area for buses to pull in. Was he allowed to park there? Probably not. 
A couple of vehicles were wedged up against a gate carrying yet another message from the MOD, telling anyone and everyone to keep out. Did the cars belong to residents of the camp? Well, probably. There was nowhere else as far as he could tell. He eased up behind the car nearest to the makeshift fence and switched off the ignition. What the hell was he doing? He had no idea, really. Maybe it seemed like a natural place to come and try and clean these brains of images of a post-nuclear wasteland. Maybe there was a part of him that was looking for some kind of absolution. Maybe he was just a stupid old guy, all spaced out on Chicago time. Well, Chad, I guess you're here for something, and you sure as hell don't have nowhere else to go right now. He got out and checked that he hadn't misread the handwritten sign on the gate. He hadn't. Visitors welcome. This brought a small smile to his face. There certainly hadn't been a whole lot of visitors welcome signs on the military road over the hill to Coolport. Muscle memory made him lean into the passenger seat to retrieve his Stetson. He pulled it on and then paused for a moment. Maybe an American in a cowboy hat might not be exactly the right kind of look for these guys. He took the hat off and tossed it onto the back seat. The gate was a homemade sort of affair. It certainly wasn't designed to keep out a riot squad of shield-banging cops. A stone-flagged path took him past the caravans, most of which were hand-painted with images of apocalypse. He couldn't help but think that they had a kind of fallen between two stools. On the one hand, the artist had been looking to achieve that elusive end-of-the-world-as-we-know-it look, which, of course, was fair enough. Hell, that was the whole point, wasn't it? But they also didn't want to make the place look all grey and depressing. These were people who obviously had a thing for bright and cheerful colours. It meant that the caravans were something of a compromise. The pictures spoke of hell coming to earth, but in a bright and cheerful sort of way. That was the irksome problem with those pesky nuclear winters. They were always so goddamn grey. He was just beginning to wonder if there was anyone home when he caught sight of a hand waving from inside what was a cross between a shed and a caravan. In here! In there, then. He opened up a makeshift sort of door and stepped into what was obviously some kind of communal area. There were old pieces of furniture and a wood burner and a whole bunch of posters and books and leaflets and six residents. Two guys with long dreadlocks gave him a smile and handshake. A cheerful woman called Sally introduced him to her three kids, who exuded mischief and enthusiasm in equal measure. Two boys and a girl, and all three with a Tom Sawyer look about them. They offered him a chair and he took it. They offered him coffee and he said, yeah, that'd be great. The eldest of the children took him through the chart on the wall, which kept a record of how many subs were resident at the base on a day-to-day -day basis. Right now there was one astute and one vanguard, but no Trafalgars. They didn't see all that many Trafalgars. People came and people went. Everyone smiled and shook hands and joined the conversation. A few weeks earlier two of the group had breached the perimeter fence and made their way through three failed security checks and were only arrested once they'd made it all the way onto the deck of one of the astute subs. So much for all that razor wire. He quizzed the young woman who had made such complete fools of the base security force. How on earth had they managed to get over all that razor wire? She beamed at the low-tech simplicity of their solution to finding a way through tens of millions of pounds worth of fortress defence. An aluminium ladder had got them to the top of the high fence. Then they'd thrown an old carpet over all three layers of razor wire and had simply bounced their way down to the other side. Two of the checkpoints had been manned by snoring guards, whilst the third had merely waved them by without looking up. The only thing that had worked had been the pressure pad alarms on the jetty. Jesus! His mind wandered back to the defence perimeters they'd put in place in their Vietnam fire bases, and he chuckled. Oh, man! Victor Charlie would just have loved it if they'd made like these good-for-nothing Brit assholes. The woman caught his smile and raised a quizzical eyebrow. What to say? He figured at least he owed these hospitable people was the truth. Ah, oh, nothing much. It's just this 
room of yours. It kind of reminds me of someplace else, that's all. Some place, please tell. I can't imagine in a place like this. Oh, ma'am, I guess you can. Funny thing is that I wasn't always a 68-year-old corn farmer. Believe it or not, I was your age once upon a time, back in the day. That's when I used to hang out in places just like this. College? No, ma'am, a whole bunch of fire bases in country. Sometimes up close and personal with the DMZ, right out in the boondocks. She gave him a polite smile. I'm afraid you've lost me there. Yeah, I guess I probably have. Vietnam, ma'am. At every fire base, we'd build ourselves some kind of a wreck room. And it was always a busted up kind of place where we'd all hang out and enjoy some downtime. They always kind of looked a lot like this. You were a soldier? Yes, ma'am. I was a soldier. I was a screaming eagle from the 101st Airborne. And that was a long time ago. Not such a good time, I guess. He wondered if his admission might make them shrink back. But it didn't. They took it in their stride, and three easy hours drifted by before he stood up and made his apologies. He told them that he was still on Chicago time, and he was ready to find a place to get his head down. Goodbyes were said, and they told him he should come back sometime. He said he'd like that. Sally walked him to the gate. Maybe this place won't be here any more this time next year. If there's a yes vote in the referendum, then that'll be that. It'll be time for us Scots to send the people in London an eviction notice. They'll just have to find somewhere else for all the submarines and missiles. Just imagine it. One day the last truck will drive off and they'll have taken all their missiles away. As she finished her sentence, a small gust of air sent off a wind chime which hung from a nearby branch. Chad's face was half turned away, and she couldn't quite catch his softly spoken reply. She thought about it all that afternoon. Part of her was certain that she heard him say, And then there'll only be one left. But why on earth would he say that? It made no sense. Ah, she must have misheard. It was probably time to pick up a pack of earbuds when she next visited the supermarket. She stood at the gate and waved him off as he pulled out onto the road and drove away. A nice man. A strange man. A man who seemed to be carrying a heavy load.